So this presentation will be on mineral paintings, portraits, and more. Um, so I'll be going over, you know, some of the initial projects I used to do before I started painting, and then I'll get a little bit into the process for the paintings themselves. And then I'll show you a couple of my examples, including some new work that I haven't shown yet. So um, what we're going to begin with is the actual uh, FMVA logo. So I believe a, a year or two ago, um, Alex and Thomas had contacted me about doing the logo for your wonderful Virginia chapter. And I just want to share some of that process with you um, in case that's not something that you've seen before. That way you can know a little bit more about how your logo came to be. So uh, the original concept that we wanted to go with was um, kind of combining the idea of those old like mining or geology club badges with uh, Barger's Quarry Pyrite, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Um, is it Barger or Barger's? Barger's? Barger's. Barger's. Um, so uh, Alex and Thomas wanted to go this direction because it's such a unique habit for pyrite that's distinguishable to uh, the Virginia localities. So we came up with a bunch of sketches uh, to start conceptualizing what we want to do for the logo. Uh, and then after that, we started playing with different uh, compositions for the logo, different ideas, um, and, and playing around with the type. So making this logo was a long process of iteration from sketches to uh, color variations and even playing around with the actual form of the pyrite crystal. And then, of course, we ended up with, here we go, the final logo that you guys have today. Um, so this is a really fun logo project. This is definitely one of my um, earlier ones that I had done. Uh, so along with my painting and illustrations, I do a lot of design work for um, mineral clubs and dealers and organizations. And this is one that I was very happy with just because it's such a cool habit for pyrite. And I think it speaks well to um, Virginia as a locality in particular. And then one other project I wanted to talk about before we get into paintings, just for fun, is these little pixel um, mineral arts that I used to do. And I actually did these before I started doing um, mineral paintings, uh, because it, at, at this point I was only 18 or 19, I think, and I was a little intimidated by painting minerals. So I actually started out by doing pixel art instead. And these are inspired by those old school video games that you would play um, like on your computer at the arcade or something. And I thought it was it would be a fun way to interpret minerals in this style. Um, and this is sort of how I debuted in the mineral art world in particular, was just sharing these you know, mini drawings in uh, Minda actually in Facebook. And then after that, I kind of sat down and I realized, you know, I'm a painter. I've been painting for a couple of years now. Why shouldn't I try doing minerals um, in paintings? So once I started that, I realized, you know, this is actually quite a lot of fun. So I'm excited to show you now a couple examples of my work. But before we get into examples, I wanted to show you just a little bit of the behind the scenes of how these paintings come to light. So this is just a picture of a basic setup that I usually have when I'm working. Um, so in the middle is a painting, hopefully something that will come out well. They don't all come out right, but most of the time I, I uh, come up with something that I'm quite happy with. And then uh, on the left is my watercolor palette. As you can see, every single one of those little um, sections in the palette have a different color. So unlike oil paint, where you do a lot of mixing on the canvas, with watercolor, you generally mix the uh, the pigments on your palette before you apply it to paper, just because um, the colors, they will soak into the paper very quickly. And instead of mixing on the paper, you do a lot of layering and you do a lot of washes to get to the final result. Um, and then, of course, I have my reference on my computer. I almost always paint from a photographic reference. Occasionally, I'll paint from life, but that is quite rare. So usually when a client wants a painting, all they have to do is send a photo. So even if my client is like halfway across the world, I can usually put something together for them. And then I always use a lamp that is close to uh, daylight uh, in terms of the temperature, just so that I can get the most accurate color possible. And then I'll have color testers on the side to test the, the way that the pigment dries before I put it on paper, just to make sure it's the right color. 
And then, as I said, I usually don't need a specimen with me um, when I'm painting it, but sometimes if I'm painting something in my own collection, I'll have the rock <laughs> next to me uh, just to have it for fun while I paint. So that being said, here are some examples of my work. So this first one is actually one of my most recent paintings that I've done. And this is a uh, smoky quartz specimen from Switzerland that actually has a Gwindel perched right on top in the back. And this was a challenge just because um, it's a very complex cluster. There's a lot of striations going on and the transparency of this specimen means that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of layering to do. So this piece was definitely something that took a lot longer than most of my paintings. But paradoxically, uh, paradoxically um, this, the paintings that take the longest and are the most difficult usually come out to be my favorites. Um, so that just goes to show that spending a lot of time on these works uh, really, really pays off in the end. And next up is a rhodochrosite. And this painting is really neat because uh, the client who commissioned this ended up selling the specimen uh, to another collector. And uh, this collector was none other than Scott Rudolph. And I didn't realize that he owned this piece. And I actually just visited him last week in New York. And I happened to see the specimen that I had painted a while back just sitting in this case. Um, so that just goes to show how small the mineral world really is. And, you know, these specimens, they stick around for a very long time. Uh, so they, they can pass through a lot of collector's hands. And you really sometimes never know where they might end up. Uh, so it was it was very cool to see the specimen in person that I painted when I wasn't expecting to. Um, but rhodochrosite in itself is a very fun mineral to paint just because the color is so vibrant. And if I remember correctly, for this piece, I actually had to go out and purchase uh, a whole new tube of paint because I was looking for a very specific color that would exactly match the hue of the Sweet Home Mine rhodochrosites in particular because they have the sort of a uh, cool pinkish red color. And I, I did my best to convey that in this painting. So these two uh, are examples of some metallic minerals and metallic minerals are a little difficult to do just because that luster is, it's very obvious when you look at it in person, but to convey that um, on paper with paint can be a little intimidating. So the specimen on the left is an acanthite from the Spang collection, and I really was drawn to painting this piece because not only did it have this metallic, you know, very beautiful luster, but it also had this very fascinating iridescence. Um, kind of like when you put metal to a hot flame for a long time, it gets all of those different colors. Um, so it was very interesting to play with those bright colors, those relatively bright colors, along with um, the, the, the gray metallic parts of the crystal. Uh, so this was a lot of fun to explore. And even though it took a very long time and it was a very intricate project, I really, really enjoyed the process. And then on the right side is a native gold specimen from the famous Eagle's Nest Mine. And this one took a very long time just because uh, rather than being a very chunky hoppered crystal, it's almost amorphous. It's crystallized, but it has this very fine texture. So when I was painting this, I actually had to use the tip of my brush and load it with just a little bit of paint. And there are some areas where I actually had to stipple this paint on little by little like you would with a pencil. Um, and that's how I slowly built up the texture in that gold cluster or crystal. And this is uh, one of my few examples of a painting that I did that was not watercolor. Uh, so this one is oil on canvas and oil paint is a medium that I'm familiar with because I did a lot of oil painting portraiture in school. Uh, so my background is actually portrait art rather than mineral art. So when I first started painting minerals, um, I was looking at other examples of mineral art and it was all watercolor. Uh, if you think back to like um, Eberhard Eckwood or Leah Luton, who are both fantastic painters that I really look up to, uh, they started with uh, watercolor. So that's what I also started with. Um, but as I continued painting, um, I, I really enjoyed the medium. But then I was thinking, what if I tried combining mineral art with a medium that I had used it before with my other works, but I haven't used in mineral painting yet. So this was actually one of my first oil painting uh, mineral portraits, as I like to call them. 
And what's interesting is this painting is about three by two feet. So it's quite large as you can see me holding it. <laughs> Um, but the specimen pictured in here, which was um, referenced from a photo from uh, the Arkansas Gallery, that specimen itself is only 23 millimeters wide. So I took the photo provided by the gallery and I blew it up and turned it into this relatively large painting. Um, so it, it, it's sort of a macro view of what is actually a very small, minuscule specimen. And I, I think it's really interesting to look at these small minerals in a macro view because you can see a lot of really interesting detail. So these two are, are another two very, very recent paintings. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on a small collection of paintings for a gallery in Hong Kong. Uh, so th these are the last few that I've been doing. And on the left is an aquamarine from Shigar Valley in Pakistan. And this one was really interesting because while the uh, terminations look like the most complicated part, you know, you would think that would be the most difficult part of this to paint. In actuality, it was the body of that main crystal that was the most difficult to do. And that's because with watercolor, um, making very smooth washes with your brush is a lot more difficult than you might expect. So instead of um, just doing one wash of color to get that dark blue that you see in the center, that was actually instead built up over many, many, many layers. And it's actually in that uh, technique where you can get really smooth gradations while still getting uh, small variations that you would actually see in the crystal. And then on the right side is a uh, quartz, or if you want to, you can call it citrine because of its yellow color. And the two crystals on the right side are actually Japan Law Twin uh, crystals, as uh, many of them do come from Zambia. And this one was actually quite difficult, probably more difficult than the aquamarine, just because of the detailing not in the main crystals, but on the smaller crystals around the base. So it, it, it's difficult to balance your painting out so that you have enough detail overall, but you don't have one part of the painting that overwhelms the other or takes away from the focus of the main crystals. So those smaller crystals on the bottom were actually a little tricky because I had to draw a line on how detailed I wanted uh, that area to be. Um, but I think it really came together and it, it supports the entire painting without taking away from the main terminations in those Japan Law Twins and the single crystal on the uh, left side. Okay, so this, this is a slide I'm very excited about. Um, so for those who don't know me, neptunite is easily my favorite mineral species in the entire world. Um, it, it's relatively unassuming just because it's it's a black mineral, you know, it doesn't have any color, but I really love the crystallography of neptunite, especially those from the Minidoite mine in California. And all three of these are um, specimens in my collection. I have, a, I guess you could call it a miniature suit of uh, neptunite specimens. And uh, I, I think the reason why I like these so much is because the contrast against the um, natural light matrix gives this really, really beautiful uh, effect when you have that black mineral in the white matrix. Although, of course, it's nice to have that benidoite in there as well. Um, and the specimen in the middle in particular is actually the backside of the piece. So I have this specimen in my cabinet displayed the other way around, but I chose to paint this from the back just because terminations were a lot more complex on that side and it really showed the unique uh, formation of neptunite. Um, but the, these three, even though they're not the flashiest paintings or the most colorful minerals, they're easily some of my favorites that I have done. And another two specimens from my collection, these are both in the barrel, um, well, species, not a group. Uh, so, of course, we have red barrel is the rather elusive red variety. And then we have emerald, which is uh, the green variety, usually colored by vanadium or chromium. And uh, this is actually the emerald, another example of painting a specimen from the backside to highlight certain aspects. So, again, this piece is actually displayed the other way around in my case, but the reason why I painted it from this angle is because I wanted to show the twinned uh, crystallization of the dolomite matrix. 
Um, so even though the Emerald is the start of the, start of the show here, I also wanted to highlight the matrix of the piece, which I believe is equally as important. And then the red barrel on the left side is a specimen that I had just acquired in uh, Denver. I had finally picked that up from uh, the dealer I purchased it from. And to me, this is a very special piece just because it's difficult to find barrels at this size or red barrels at this size. Um, this specimen itself, the crystal is two centimeters, which is significant for the species. Um, but this was actually a challenge to paint because the red barrel has a very particular um, magenta uh, red hue. Uh, so this is another example of having to take my time to mix those pigments to get the right color. And then you see that, of course, in that main uh, crystal face that's facing uh, the viewer. And then, of course, on the other side, the color is a little different because that's where the light is reflecting off of those lustrous surfaces. But I, I wanted to pair these two together just because the color contrast is very nice, almost Christmassy in a way. And I, I really like the idea, especially in artwork, of pairing similar specimens together, such as, you know, on a wall, you could have two paintings of different varieties of the same species, and you can display that together to um, show the connection between those two. So this is another recent piece that I've done, and this specimen was honestly extremely difficult to paint. Um, it, it, it was a lot of trouble, but again, like I said before, uh, the paintings that are the most difficult usually come out the best. So this is an Azurite Malachite specimen from the Sepon mine in Laos. And this piece was actually collected by my client. So he went into the mine uh, before 2015 when it closed and uh, excavated this himself. And I, I think the aesthetics of the specimen really lends itself well to a painting just because those two azurites make for a beautiful focal point on top of this very fuzzy, fibrous malachite matrix. And the matrix in particular took a long time because of that uh, velvety quality. And I actually had to ruin one of my brushes for this. So what I did was I took a brush and I scrubbed it on a piece of paper to fray the brush. And then what I did was I took that brush, I put it in the pigment. And then when I applied it to the paper, I could get those um, individual crystals of malachite in uh, single brush strokes instead of having to do them individually. So that was a sort of shortcut I made to get the correct texture uh, for this matrix. But even with that shortcut, it did take a very long time to do. Uh, so generally, the finer the crystals, um, the, the more difficult and more prolonged the process is. But of course, uh, as you can see here, it really did pay off. So these are three different examples of some elbites that I had painted. Of course, elbite and tourmaline in general is a very popular species and or group um, for mineral collectors to, well, collect. Uh, for good reason, of course, they have really great color, and there's a lot of variety within albites. And these three examples I picked out um, just because I really enjoyed the color contrast between them. So on the very left side was a specimen I picked up in Denver, and that is from Barra de Salinas. And it has this really beautiful, gemmy, thick book of lapidolite on, uh, acting as the matrix for that albite. And I thought that color combination was really fascinating. And then in the middle was a paprox specimen from, uh, I believe, Afghanistan or Pakistan, um, one of the two uh, that I had acquired recently, although that uh, painting and specimen is now in the collection of Wayne Shrimp. And this one was a lot of fun just because the aesthetics, especially on that matrix, just makes for a good painting. Generally speaking, specimens on matrix and combination pieces do very well in artwork. And this one was actually a little difficult just because that thin blue zoning towards the termination uh, was very subtle. So I had to find out a way to capture that without it being overwhelming or too unrealistic. Um, so for this painting, I actually had to start over because of uh, the color zoning hadn't turned out quite right in the first run. Uh, so paintings don't always turn out right, but thankfully if you haven't gone too far in it, you can start over and try again. And it almost always turns out better the second time around. And then on the very right is a specimen now in the Dreyer collection, uh, not specimen, painting. 
Um, I believe the specimen itself is in the collection of Martin Gruel, but um, the painting itself uh, is in the Dreyer collection. And this piece, I almost regret selling this painting just because um, I really enjoyed the way that the termination was painted and the reflections on that very complex uh, form lends itself you know, very well to the painting. And the color zoning in the middle is really fascinating because you get that contrast between the red and the green in the termination. So it's almost a full spectrum of rainbow in just one single crystal. And I think that was really beautiful. And that's what inspired me to paint that specimen. And then this is my most recent painting that I've done. I quite literally finished this painting just last night. So this is a Roger Lee Mine fluorite, and uh, the, these uh, fluorites are famous for their really incredible emerald green color and, of course, their daylight fluorescence. And this particular painting was very challenging just because there is very, very rich crystallization in this matrix. And one issue that can come up when you're painting a specimen that has a lot of crystals is that sometimes those individuals can get a little lost in the grand scheme of things. So sometimes when you're painting, you have to accentuate either the highlights of crystal faces or the shadows and intensify one or the other to create just a little more contrast. Not so much that it's unrealistic, but enough to help differentiate the different crystals within that specimen. And of course, it helps to have those bands of matrix that are showing through as a little bit of contrast against the fluorite crystals. And there is even a little Galena crystal that is peeking out from that right side. So altogether, I think those elements uh, make a very nice specimen and subsequently a very nice painting. So I, I think this particular uh, painting being the most recent I've done kind of shows the evolution I've uh, had in my artwork, not just in terms of skill, but also in uh, what I'm willing to tackle. If a client had shown me this paint or this specimen to paint, maybe even a year ago, I probably would have said no because of the very rich crystallization and the intricacy. But as I continue to paint, which I've been doing uh, for about three years now, I believe, um, I I'm starting to get out of my comfort zone and I'm trying out uh, specimens I normally would not attempt. And I, I'm just trying to paint some really complicated specimens that will really wow the audience. And with that, thank you for um, going through my presentation with me. I was very happy to share some of my examples. And uh, down below are just some links for my email and my Instagram in case you want to look at other examples of my work, as this is just a very small breadth of my portfolio. And now if there are any questions, I would love to take those.